Oh, your sign just fell. Oh. Hey, just to make sure that this uh, goes smooth, can I get a sign holder <laughs> by any chance with someone oh. like the volunteer? Jim. Yes. He needs a sign holder. I can't, I can't he, would oh, someone want to volunteer? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I'll get, I'll, you know what? I'll give it to you. I don't know what I do you have any picks and shovels? Yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> put it in the grass right <laughs> The lights came on. I gotta make sure these all my uh, tools are in place here so they don't blow away. Looks like we got a storm coming. Do you need a rock or something and something to hold something in place? <laughs> I got one of those. Hey, thank you. I wasn't even thinking. Sure. Thanks. Okay. All right, guys. Looks like we're ready. Yep. Uh, Stacy, thank you for waiting. Appreciate it for everybody else. Uh, I'm a little bit underslept, and I made a wrong turn getting here, and I've been here before, and it just, I was zoning out. So my apologies, uh, but better late than never. And hopefully, what I'm about to present to you will bless you. Because you know, ultimately, we need encouragement, but we also need the truth. You know, really the, the encouragement that we need lies in the truth, you know, through love. And that only comes, real love comes from knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. So I'm going to start by asking the most important thing. How many of you are saved? You know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're born again. Raise your hand. Wow. That's everybody. Just a bot. Well, praise God. All right. Well, good. Because I'm sure pretty much what I'm going to be bringing to you, it's going to be somewhat preaching to the choir. You may learn some new things. I hope you do. Um, but that will be good, you know, if it blesses you and it builds you up. With that said, why don't you just agree with me in a short prayer, please. Heavenly Father, as we look at this topic of being prepared according to your word, we ask that wisdom... Uh, would be imparted through me as I speak, Lord. Not of my own accord, uh, not of my own will, but of your will, according to the scriptures. And may it bless your people here today. And Father, I thank you that uh, they've wanted to come here, they were eager to come here and learn the truth. And we thank you and we ask of all things to be blessed by you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. And amen. How does one prepare? You know, what's the most important part of preparing for anything? And hopefully that's going to be answered today. You know, I'm not here to give you the nuts and bolts, you know, of prepping, so to speak. You know, as far as water purification, food storage, things of that nature. I do know a little bit about those things. Um, there's actually, I know, people here that know a lot more than I do. Um, what I want to do, you know, through the Lord's leading, is talk about the things that are most important when it comes to preparing. So there's two basic questions that I hope are going to be answered here today. What should you prepare for? How should you prepare? You know, why do we even need to talk about this? And it's absolutely important because we do. I am a pastor. I'm ordained. I'm also a social studies teacher. I taught for three years at a public school in Beaver County. 
I've taught various subjects. I'm also a coach. I'm a track coach. I have a background in health and fitness. But most importantly, I'm a born-again believer. Regardless of what anybody does, that is the most important thing. You need to know Jesus Christ, which I could see many of you do. And I thank the Lord for that. So, let's start on with what we should prepare for. Or, and also why we should prepare. Now, I got a diagram here. It's actually... Could someone hold this, please? So it doesn't fall down. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Go ahead there. If you could just hold it up on your own. And I can explain it. Can everybody see that? Or are you having trouble? Do you know what this is? It's a normal distribution curve. Okay, and I certainly don't uh, subscribe, subscribe to everything that these curves are used for, like to measure intelligence. I've seen this in the public schools. It's bogus. But this actually does have some utility when it's applied correctly. All right, so what we have here is basically your, your fundamental needs of life. Water, food, shelter, medical attention, etc. And I'm sure you can think of some things on your own. Let me ask you this. Has anybody here in their life, and I'm talking beyond normal circumstances, beyond your control, have, has went without three meals a day since the time they were a kid? Okay, one person. Two? It's a long time ago. Okay, long time ago. Hey, does fasting count? No, it doesn't count. I'm talking <laughs> circumstances beyond your control. Yeah, that's good. You know, where you couldn't get access to food, you couldn't have access to water. Everybody here, I can see, has been able to eat three meals a day and get sufficient water. And what about shelter? Have you ever went without shelter, heat? Okay. All right, that's in the 100%. We're all accustomed to this. And you know what? I believe it's the blessings of liberty. Because from the beginning... There was a blessing on this nation. There were godly men. And there was a form of government at one time that we're rapidly losing that did incorporate biblical principles into it. Now, as you can see, and you can imagine other countries, this is not the norm. You think of India. You think of Latin America, places like Ecuador. It starts to drop off. Now, could there ever come a day? I'm going to flip this over, Jim. Can you flip it? Thank you. Where well, that bell is upside down, and literally your world is turned upside down, would that ever be a possibility? Yeah. Yes, it could. Absolutely. Where food, water, shelter, etc., medical attention, all of a sudden it's not 100% anymore. That's on the fringes. It's it's marginalized. This becomes your new norm. How about education? Education. What, ed, how the delivered dumbing down, how the education went down here. You know? Oh, well, of course. Okay. But that's something else here. I'm talking okay. about things that are absolutely essential that you okay. need for your physical body to survive. Okay. Could that become a reality? Yes. It absolutely can. How do I know this? Because this is tied in with something else that's absolutely important that's really not talked about. And that's the index of social health. Now, for decades, our country measured its social health based on 16 categories. Now, I didn't list all of them here. Actually, my wife and my daughter helped me prepare these. Uh, so I just told my daughter to list nine of them. So we got child abuse, teen suicide, health insurance coverage, weekly earnings, and some of these others you can read on your own. I won't go through all of them. But when these were next to, to nothing in terms of, you know, uh, one you know, say of health insurance, or child abuse rates were low. The social health of the nation was high. This peaked at almost 80. It's, it's a score from 0 to 100. This peaked at almost 80 in 1972. That's important to note, because in 1973, and we're seeing this throughout our lifetimes, the Supreme Court steps in, and rules 
you know, judicial activism, they rule in favor of something that's totally against our Constitution and ultimately against the Bible. So in 1973, do you know what the Supreme Court ruled on? What was the major case of that year? Roe v. Wade. Thank you. Roe v. Wade. What's interesting is 72 index of social health was at its highest. Then after 73, it started to precipitously drop. And by the time you get to 1990, it's at 42. The last time they actually did an analysis took account, you know, the government agencies involved, it was 2011 and they stopped doing it. Why? Obviously because it's so dismally low and they have to keep the truth from the American people. That's an indicator that the country is on its way out as we know it. If you don't have social health, you don't have strong families, you don't have a nation to build on or to build with. So it's important to keep note of that. Wasn't that the, the fall of the Roman Empire was the so, social health issues? Boy, did you, did you look through my notes? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm actually getting that. I'm going to talk about the Roman Empire. So we are collapsing as a nation. I think it's evident. I know many of you here understand that and know it. But this is what the Bible says. See, I look through statistics. I study history. But ultimately, the scriptures reveal the health of a nation. Proverbs 14, chapter, chapter 14, verse 34 says this. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You understand what that means? When a nation as a whole continually, habitually sins, they're a reproach to the Lord. They can't be blessed anymore. So back to our one graph here. Your world can turn upside down very easily because it has to do with God's judgment. And that's solely what it has to do with. There are secular historians, they can give you a myriad of reasons why societies collapse. In fact, many of them, when they do objective research, come to the conclusion that there are indicators, there are characteristics. But I've hardly seen any of them go to the Bible for their proof. The Bible tells us everything we need to know. Here's one of the things that happens when you see that, that bell go upside down and your world gets turned upside down, you can be assured that there are some things that are going to follow. One of them is famine. How do we know this? 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 25. In the days of Elisha, there was a famine in Samaria. It was very bad. The Syrian king, Ben-Hadad, came up and sieged Samaria to the point where the people were involved in cannibalism because they had nothing to eat. But it was a judgment from God. Jeremiah 14, Jerusalem in Zedekiah's day experienced a severe famine because the Babylonians surrounded Judah and would not let anybody out. They had no access to food. This is one of the strategies of warfare. Now, in light of this, what should you prepare for? You should prepare because God judges nations. And you don't want to be against God when this comes. You want to be on his side. You want to be his friend, not his foe. Another way to understand this that I found out is the importance of numbers. For any of you that have studied the scriptures, numbers have great significance. Okay, they aren't just randomly placed in there, you know, as if God just chose a number at random and said, okay, I'm going to place this here. It has a meaning to it. 200 in the scriptures demonstrates insufficiency. It means there's a deficit. Something has fallen short. A nation or a person has been weighed and they're found wanting. We see this in Joshua chapter 7, verse 21. The Israelites were told to take all the cities of Canaan, and they went up against Ai, Ai. Now, they had tremendous success up to that point. They could not defeat this group of people that lived in Ai. And there was, wasn't many of them. Something was terribly wrong. Well, Joshua goes back, and the Lord tells him there's a man named Achan who's hiding the spoils of the city, which they were told not to take. 
When they go to his tent and they uncover what's underneath, they find 200 shekels of silver. Okay, that's an, obviously an indicator of insufficiency, disobedience. 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 26. Absalom came against his father David, who was the rightful heir. He revolted. Eventually, Absalom died. His hair was so long as he was riding away, it got caught in a tree and he was strangled. When they weighed the hair, it was 200 shekels. It weighed 200 shekels. Not only did Absalom lose his life, he may have lost his soul. Because if you understand typology in Scripture, David was a type of Christ. You know, he pointed to what Jesus would do when he would come during his millennial reign, which still, of course, yet has to take place. But there's something else that's also interesting. 200 also demonstrates the life cycle of nations. And that's very important to know. Alexander Tyre, he was a Scottish historian. He demonstrated that through studying empires, nations, that they go through this cycle. And it starts out in, in what's actually in eight stages. And it starts out from bondage to spiritual faith. Then you go from spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependence, and from the, the dependence back into bondage. And I believe we're right at that point. We've come to the place where we are dependent. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit. Also, some interesting things to note about 200. You've heard of Jonah, the prophet, right? How many of you have heard of Jonah? Let me see that you're still here. You're still with me. Okay, good. Jonah was commanded by the Lord to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was part of the Assyrian Empire. It was the most powerful empire of its day. A lot of people were going to be destroyed if they did not repent. Jonah went there. The king listened to him. Many people listened. They put on sackcloth and ashes. They repented. The nation was spared. You know what's interesting? From Jonah to Nahum. Now Nahum comes on the scene a hundred years later. They go back to their old ways of sin. They were righteous, and now they're back in sin. They're a reproach to God. Nahum prophesies against the Ninevites in the Assyrian Empire. That from Jonah to Nahum was a hundred years. But God is slow to wrath. He hopes all would come to repentance. He gave them another hundred years, and then guess what? The Babylonians invaded. They came in and wiped out the Assyrians. Two hundred years. Our own country. We officially became a republic, a constitutional republic in 1776. The signing of the Declaration of Independence. 1800, not that long after, Charles Finney started to preach around the colonies. It was called the Second Great Awakening. People repented, they got saved, they came to Jesus Christ. Now, you think of that, 1800, 200 years later, where are we at? Year 2000. It's almost 200 years. Time's up. And I do believe, sometimes it's about 200, sometimes God extends it a little more. You know, no pun intended, but there's a grace period that he's still given us to repent. But we're fast approaching its end. Hey, Jim, thank you so much for being patient. I'm holding that. Okay, well, there's more. <laughs> Sorry. 400 is an extremely important number, too, in the scriptures. It's a divine, perfect time period. Here's some examples. The children of Israel leaving Egyptian bondage from the time they were enslaved, 400 years. Here's something very interesting. The Turks capture Palestine in 1517. Britain defeats the Turks 400 years later in 1917. America's first colony, Jamestown, 1607 to almost now, which would be 2007. Egypt was judged. After 400 years, they were laid waste. And it says in the scriptures they would never rise again as a nation, and they didn't. Now, what does that mean for us? Are we like Egypt? Yes, we are. Many parallels between us and ancient Egypt. We worship the same gods, we're involved in the same sexual sins, and there's just too many parallels to ignore this. It does not mean, it 
doesn't look good. I can just tell you that at this point. But this 400 years, the greatest thing of all is the intertestament period. From the prophet Malachi to John the Baptist was 400 years. Now, after each of these, something of great significance happens. It's, there's a paradigm shift that takes place. Now, this last one, of course, if you're a Christian, you know what happens. Who does John the Baptist herald the coming of? Messiah. Jesus, correct? Absolutely. All these other things, too, there was a major paradigm shift that took place. And I believe we're getting ready, or we're on the heels of another one that's going to happen soon. Okay, thanks. And we have more. So numbers are absolutely vital. When you study them, you can understand a lot from them in the scriptures. There's a lot of parallels between us right now and past civilizations. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about Rome. There are many, I mean, you, you could go civilization to civilization, nation to nation, it would be a list as long as my arm. But I'm just going to focus on the fundamentals of Rome for now. And I'm going to give you a few examples from the scriptures. One of the causes of, of decline, the decline of Rome was an economic or economic causes. Increases in taxes to support the army and the bureaucracy. Does anybody know how much this war that we're involved in right now has cost us? Trillion. Over a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars. What were you talking about? The, the war we're involved in right now, Iraq, Afghanistan. Oh, okay. Bringing in the drugs. Oh, there was another one. Vietnam. Also, the indenture of farmers to wealthy landowners. Of course, we see that. Post-World War II, that unfolded so rapidly that the family-owned farm is almost non-existent. Monsanto, ConAgra, uh, Cargill, all these companies have bought up this farmland, and now we have nothing but mass-produced food that, in a sense, is killing us. Okay, there's parallels there with Rome, too. Many independent farmers were driven off their lands as well in ancient Rome. Only to uh, you know, be at the, the mercy of big corporations, or what amounted to corporations then. And then, of course, economic, the reliance on slave labor. We're seeing more of that with illegal immigration coming in. Also, political causes, internal power struggles, dissension, strife. And believe me, I, I honestly believe this is deliberate. It's meant to weaken us, break us down. Increased government corruption. More than ample uh, examples to demonstrate that. Every day we get an example of somebody embezzling money, using their office, taking favors, selling the, the White House, uh, you know, the Lincoln bedroom, and on and on it goes. And then, of course, oppressive government, loss of popular support. You know, it's amazing. For what the American people see, they're still willing, to some extent, to trust their leaders, which to me does not make sense at all. They've proven that they have no credibility time and time and time again. But it's like the scripture says, a dog returns to its own vomit. Then the military causes, poorly trained armies. You notice since Clinton, our armies have been deliberately weakened, allowing homosexuals, you know, all these other policies where we can't really have a strong, you know, fighting force anymore. It's all a deliberate attempt to weaken us. They're also... And then, of course... I'm sorry. Germanic invasions for the Roman Empire. Are we experiencing that now? Of course, illegal immigration. We have a, how many people coming over the border daily, inundating us, flooding us. They're here to take over. It's called a reconquista. You know, it's almost as if, you know, you go back to the Gazdan Treaty, 1836, you know, after Santa Ana was defeated, you know, we were allowed to take Mexico, or I'm sorry, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas. and Texas. So they're coming back to take that land. Same parallels there. Okay, and also, loyal, little loyalty among hired soldiers. Why? Because they don't believe in the Constitution. They certainly don't believe, a lot of them, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they come into this country and they're here to get what they want. 
and they really don't have any loyalty to our principles. The last thing, social causes. The devotion of upper classes to luxury and self-interest. You know, we hear about this widening gap between rich and poor. Well, it's absolutely there. And then, of course, the decline in patriotism, discipline and devotion to duty, which is becoming more non-existent almost every day as we speak. But there's also another civilization that we have parallels with. And we can see this just in the past three weeks. Sodom and Gomorrah from Genesis 19. Of course, almost everybody here, I'm sure, knows about the SCOTUS ruling. Supreme Court of the United States three weeks ago legalizing same-sex marriage forcing it on everybody. Did you know something? Back in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, there wasn't just Sodom and Gomorrah, there was three other cities. They were called the cities of the plain. What happened was, and you can see this in the, read about this in the book of Jasher, which scripture refers to. They got together, they convened, and they decided to pass a law that would allow homosexuals to bring their activities out in the open, out into the streets. The government, and it was actually a group of judges, sanctioned it. We have the same exact thing today. Shortly after, God's judgment came down. What's terrible to know is that when any civilization has done this, it's only, and it's always the same time frame, 10 years before that nation civilization totally collapses. And it lays on the ash heap of history. I'm going to read you a few verses from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 28. If you've ever read this chapter, this pretty much is a template for what happens when a nation obeys God and when it disobeys God. Now, of course, at the time, this applied to Israel. But any nation that claims to follow Jesus Christ, if they follow the words in this book, they're blessed. If they don't, God makes it clear what's going to happen to them. I'm going to read you verses 1, and, 1 through 3. And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God, to observe and to do all His commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on you and overtake you, if you shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Now here's what's interesting. There are 68 verses. The last time I checked, we've got 68 verses in this one chapter. It's quite a hefty uh, chapter. The blessings are verses 1 through 14. The curses, if disobedience occurs, are from 15 all the way to 68. So God is giving very serious warnings if a nation rebels, what's going to happen to them. And we see this unfolding right before our very eyes. I'll give you a few proofs. You know, you go back easily 50, 60 years. We were the top steel producer in the whole world. And in fact, this whole region here was known for steel production. Not just the United States, but Western Pennsylvania. Of, of course, many of you, I'm sure, have heard of U.S. Steel, have you? Okay, U.S. Steel was the number one producer at that time. Up until 2011, you know what's happened? Bao Steel, a competitor from China, became number two, and the first one is a multinational conglomerate. But what's interesting is you go back 50, 60 years, China, under Mao Zedong, had a program. It was called the Great Leap Forward. And part of that was the industrialization of China. And he had these peasants producing steel in their backyards in these little furnaces, and it was a dismal failure. It didn't work. They couldn't compete with us. Now, 50, 60 years later, we're number 11. China's number 2. How does that happen? Who's number 1? It's a multinational conglomerate. I forget the name of it, sir. But yeah, it's, it's a bunch of nations that, that have come together, a consortium. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. I'm sure that they probably have their hand in it somehow. The U.S. Steel has companies, all, uh, factories all over the world now. 
Yeah, no, they not quite exactly yeah. that. Yeah. They, they, they they're not the number one, one anymore. We I'm aren't sure. benefiting from it as much as yeah. Well, of course. But do you see what happens when a nation turns its back on God? Here's what it says. Well, exactly. But here's what it says in verse 44. He shall lend to you, and you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. We used to be the biggest creditor nation in the whole world. Now we're the largest debtor nation. China has lent us trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Japan, billions. Mm -hmm. And on and on the list goes. People used to come to us for loans. Now we got to go to them. Do you see the scriptures? They come alive in this area. They come alive in everything. But when you're studying this, you know how this pertains to national judgment and national health and vitality. The Bible has all the answers. Go back 50, 60 years. Illegal immigration wasn't a problem. In fact, if you looked at history in the 20th century, there was a lot of Mexicans that tried to come up into the United States. And at that time, probably the only good thing he ever did, FDR, he had the Mexican Repatriation Act. A lot of them were sent on, on rail cars and sent back. And they were told if they wanted to come here, they had to do it legally. They had to go through the process like everybody else and become American citizen. So for what, two, three decades, that wasn't even an issue. Now where are we at? Turning point, 1965, Kennedy, Immigration Reform Act. All of a sudden, the door was slowly open, and then the flooding began, and it just started, and it just kept coming and coming and coming. The dam is about to break. 50, 60 years. What about Islam? Was it a threat to this country? No. No. Actually, I just showed you, 1917, the Turks were the last Islamic empire. They were defeated by the British in World War I. I didn't know. Now, they never rose up again. It wasn't an issue. And then in the 60s, all of a sudden, these acts of terrorism start cropping up here and there. The 70s, we heard more about this. You know, the Munich Massacre, 1972 Olympics. There, all of this fits together. It all coalesces. It comes together. None of this is happenstance. And now, of course, 9-11, mm -hmm. other instances, and I don't believe it's going to end there unless we repent. They're going to keep coming. They're going to keep attacking. Nothing's going to stop them. So how do you really, truly prepare? Okay, we know why we need to prepare. But how do you prepare? How do you be ready for anything? Does the Bible teach that? Yes, it does. I'd like to show you. This is just a summary of what I've seen in the scriptures. This is prepping for three basic common sense things. Protection, provisions, practicality. If you notice, prepping has three Ps. It's just a good... It's, just a, a learning device, a mnemonic, a way to remember this. Protection, provisions, practicality. The three Ps. Thanks, John. How are we to go about this, our attitude? What should our attitude be? Well, I'm going to give you some scriptures that are important. First of all, it isn't wrong to prepare physically. Okay, as I've just pointed out. Genesis 41. Joseph, the Lord put him second in command in Egypt. If you ever read this passage, what happens is he gets a dream about a famine that's going to hit Egypt. Of course, Pharaoh is still the, the main guy. He's the number one leader. But Joseph goes to him and tells him, we need to prepare for this. The Lord showed me there's going to be a, there's going to be a famine here. And it's going to last seven years. This Pharaoh was wise. He took Joseph's advice and the Egyptians lived. That's one example. And of course, probably one of the most famous that even people outside the church know is Noah and the ark. Noah prepared. Built an ark, put provisions on it. Floodwaters came. Everybody was trying to get in. Noah and his family safe. It's another example. In Proverbs, chapter 27, verse 12, makes it clear that a wise man sees danger and he prepares himself but the foolish pass on and they're punished. Now we're to operate in faith as believers, not fear. And that's important to, to note as well. 
You know, in Luke 22, Jesus makes it clear, you know, that there's a rich man, and he's acting foolishly. He's just storing up things. And he's doing it. He really doesn't even need to do it so much, but he just wants to accumulate more. And the question is asked, what if your soul is required of you to do you prepared physically, but you haven't prepared spiritually. And that's where real preparation comes in. But that is the preparation. But that also be mentally too. Spiritually well, yeah, that's and absolutely mentally. absolutely tied in. Yeah. Your, your mind, your body, and your soul. I'm also going to take you to Matthew just for a minute. In chapter 6, the Lord gave us these words. <coughs> It's warnings against anxiety and worry. And he says this in verse 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Okay, we're not to be consumed, you know, with wanting to have enough food and water and whatever else, shelter. We see danger, we do prepare. The scriptures teach that. But that is not to be our focus. Look, you can have all the food in place. You can have everything you need. But you know what? If you die without Christ, you gain nothing. Jesus said of himself, what's it profit a man if he gains the world and loses his soul? Now many of you, you've pointed out that you are believers, you're born again. So this I say to you, keep your focus on Jesus Christ. Keep your focus on the Word of God. God will provide. And He knows what you can provide and what you can't. Be wise, don't be foolish. If you can prepare, prepare a little something. If you can't, God will meet your need. He said it never leave the righteous begging for bread. Amen. Also, talk a little bit about something I call a code of conduct in crisis. There's four things. They spell out code. There's courage. And we see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. There's many scriptures that point to these things. There's quite a few, and I'm just going to read a few of them. I'm not going to go over every single one. You know, it says in this verse that when you're weak, you are strong. You know, we do want to depend on God for our needs. But we also, if He's prompting us to do something, we move, we do it. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, we're told that we be strong in the Lord. He protects us. The next thing is optimism. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. God said He would give us an expected end. If we are His child, our lives are in His hands. We have an expected end. We don't need to fear. God will take care of everything, but we also need to know what the Scriptures say and act upon them. The third thing is determination. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31, it says, If God be for us, who can be against us? And the last thing, and I have to admit, this would probably be my hardest area when a crisis happens, is enthusiasm. Because when you experience something that you've never experienced, even in the church, it's a trying time. I mean, how many of you have went through something extremely difficult in your lives? You don't have to say what it is. Just raise your hand. Were you a believer then? Did you struggle through it? To accept it? I mean, God knows it was going to happen. Now, He wants to see how we're going to react to it. So we need to have enthusiasm. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And that's the code of conduct in a crisis, according to the Scriptures. We need to be spiritually and mentally prepared. Because I believe we're on the cusp of judgment. It's very soon at the door. We need to pray for our country. We need to pray that our government turns from its wickedness, turns to Jesus Christ. But if they don't, please, be prepared. Be a prepper in Christ.
Amen? Amen. 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 Let me pray for all of you, please. Heavenly Father, as you know, this message closes, I ask you, not just for my brethren here, not just for the visitors, but all of us would have that strength that only comes from knowing you, knowing your Son, and abiding in your Word. And if there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, I pray that they do. I pray that you give them a hunger, that the Holy Spirit touches their heart, and they open their heart to hear the Gospel. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And if any of you wants to hear my testimony, how I was saved through the blood of Christ, I'd be glad to share it with you. So please, come forward and see me as I grab something to eat. And thank you. Lord bless you for listening. You're welcome.